Hi guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Sarah and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love true crime, definitely hit that notification bell button, leave me a comment down below saying hi and like the video. Today's case is requested by one of my OG subscribers, Big Kel. So thank you, Big Kel. I've watched a few videos about this case, a couple documentaries, and I've read up so much about this case because it really hooked me. It's about an Australian woman named Kelly Lane. She was beautiful. She was an Australian water polo champion. She had it all until the question about what happened to her baby, Tegan, arose. But this case is so much more than that. Before we get into it, guys, I wanted to thank today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. If you don't already know, a VPN is a virtual private network which creates a secure connection between your device and the internet. This secure connection means no one can take a peek at your private browsing activity. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like going to a public restroom and not shutting the door. Anyone walking past can just watch you do your thing. There are so many ways to use ExpressVPN, so forget incognito mode because you are very much no cognito. <laughs> because did you know that your internet service providers can sell your data and see everything you do online? ExpressVPN is the best because it is super easy to use. I just open up the app on one of my devices and connect with just one click. I don't know what I did before ExpressVPN because researching cases now is so much better because I have access to so many different articles from different countries. I just select the country I want and it changes my geographical location. So if I wanted to access articles in say India, I can do so because they have service in 94 countries and blazing fast speeds. Also my favorite, Jay and I have been together for what practically our whole lives. So we really need to spice up our Netflix and chill game. Yes. Did you know you don't see the whole Netflix library? They are hiding thousands of shows from you based on your location. And what better way to do that than to hop on over to Spain and watch some spicy telenovelas. We watched The Reconquest and it's so good. It's about old childhood sweethearts spending one night together, which leads them to revisit their past and discuss their future. So shut that restroom door and protect your privacy online and go to expressvpn.com slash Zara V to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN free. Make sure to use the link below in my description box so that they know you're from the Zara V fam. Thank you so much to ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's video, but thank you so much to you guys for all your continued love and support. Okay, let's get back into it. There is so much information out there about this case, but I find that a lot of it can get really muddled and a bit confusing. So I'm going to give you the meat of it all today and yeah, let's get into it. Kelly Lane was born on 21st March 1975 to a well-known surfer, rugby player, policeman, uh, Robert Lane, and his wife, Sandra, who was a hospital worker, but she was also a um, water polo coach. She has a brother named Morgan, and they grew up living on Manly in Sydney's northern beaches, which is quite a wealthy area, and she began living there when she was four years old. She went to high school in Manly as well at McKellar Girls High. And then after high school, she studied an arts degree at the University of Newcastle. And after that, she went to the Australian College of Physical Education. And during that time, she also worked at Ravenswood um, Girls High School as a PE teacher, so a physical education teacher. Now, during her high school years, Kelly was a normal girl. She just did the things that normal girls do. She, you know, partied, she dated boys, but she was a little bit different because of her water polo career. She was super talented and everyone in her town, in the town of Manly, knew who she was, but not only because of her, because of her father, everyone knew her parents, but that town is also the type of town that everyone just knows everyone. Her parents were kind of just always at every event from like surf club events to footy matches. Kelly, because of that, was very popular. She was very pretty and she had a very promising future. She was in a swimsuit for majority of the time because of um, her playing at such an advanced level of water polo from such a young age. She was an elite athlete and her mother, Sandra, 
was her manager. And, you know, when you grow up being an athlete, she really didn't have much time to herself in a way because she was always training. Being a teenager and she spent a lot of her time, especially after school and early mornings, training. I read that sometimes, I don't know if this is true, but I read that sometimes she would be training from like 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. And really, like that's, how do you even train that long? But I'm pretty sure it does happen sometimes. Her many coaches over that period of time just reinforced into Kelly of what was expected of her. She was expected to perform. She was expected to be the best. And sport, especially achieving high in sport, was going to be the thing that rewarded her. Kelly's parents were heavily involved in sport and in her sporting career. She was pretty close to her father and she, well, he was her role model. And not only that, she became one of the boys because she had a brother, but she became one of the boys to him. And I think that's mainly because she was doing so well in sports that he kind of saw her as like him because he was such a good sports player, rugby player. I feel like that's what they related on. She had a really great athletic body. She drank pretty heavily. I think all the teenagers in that area at the time did, but in all honesty, especially when I was growing up, Australia is just like that. Like we can drink. Well, not me, but Australians can drink. (laughs) And she wasn't super girly. Like she didn't wear a ton of makeup or anything like that. She was just honestly very naturally good looking. From a very early age, Kelly kind of got the idea that her family, her parents especially, just didn't like dealing with negative emotions or just emotions in general. Because of that, she just learned to suppress her emotions. But you're a teenager, you're a girl, you know, you crave connection. I can't even really imagine, but, you know, you're an elite athlete. You train so much. You probably have so much pressure on you. And you're only in high school and high school alone comes with all these different pressures. So I feel like it would be a very stressful life, but at the same time to achieve something that great, you kind of need to go through the stress, you know, especially me now having to raise children. I feel like that would be pretty hard, but at the same time, like when you're pushed so hard in a way, I don't know. Do you guys feel like that's when you also reap, the big rewards if you stick to it. Like if she is working so hard at being this elite athlete, how are you going to be so good if you don't train and if you don't have that pressure and if you don't work for it? She could really go places and she probably was going to go places and that's what her family expected of her. Now, when Kelly was in high school, like I said, she was pretty good looking and she had a ton of boys that were into her. I mean, She had a great body. I mean, who wouldn't if you (laughs) train that hard? She really, to me, I think she was really attractive and she had just had a bunch of guys after her and she was the type that would date the guys. She was funny and she was super attractive and people or her friends or just people in the neighborhood said that she had this kind of sexual energy. And I think what they meant by that is that she was pretty flirty, maybe. She was fun. She just had that vibe about her where people or guys wanted to approach her. In 1992, in her final year of high school, she began dating this boy named Aaron Tayak. And Aaron states that they were in love. You know, they were young, but they were in love. They both really loved each other. And they did the things that normal teenagers do. And during their course of sleeping together and, you know, being in a relationship, Kelly finds herself pregnant. Now, this pregnancy... Aaron states came as a shock to the both of them because Kelly was on the pill. So it's not like they were being reckless. I don't think, I think things happen and she just ended up falling pregnant. Now the pill is like 99% effective, isn't it? But I think it's only that effective if you take it perfectly, like perfectly. But if you take it like a normal person would, I think it's like 91% effective. And that obviously allows for some accidents. So she was only 17 years old at this time when she fell pregnant. So because of this and because of all the pressure and the belief of what Kelly was supposed to be was on her shoulders. So she decides that she doesn't want to proceed with the pregnancy. So she decides to terminate this pregnancy. Now, Aaron and Kelly, they both agreed to terminate the pregnancy. But Aaron states that Kelly was actually super devastated, but she had to focus on her sports. She couldn't 
have this baby. She, like everyone was depending on her. She couldn't be the one to disappoint her family. Kelly also dreamt of making the Sydney Olympic team. So she had to focus. Now, when she fell pregnant and had this termination, the both of them never told anyone. They just decided to terminate the pregnancy, but keep everything a secret. A couple years later in 1994, her relationship with Aaron, it ends. And I'm not sure if this next relationship that she has is when, like, did she have this relationship while she was with Aaron or if it was after Aaron, but she ends up having this affair with a married man. And I feel like she could have had this relationship, like this affair with this married man while she was with Aaron, because towards the end of her relationship with Aaron, they were not doing so well. They were always fighting and it just wasn't working out. So at this point, she's 18, 19 years old, having this affair, possibly still with Aaron. She gets pregnant again. Again, she's like, can't have this baby. So she has another termination. But this time she doesn't tell anyone about the pregnancy, not even Aaron. So she decides to go and do this alone. And now she obviously wanted to keep this a secret. So she goes to a different clinic. But this clinic refused to carry out the termination for her. And the reason they refused is because Kelly was a lot further along in her pregnancy than she initially believed. She was 20 weeks pregnant. So she had to go return to the original clinic that she had her first termination at. And this was not ideal for her because she didn't want to be remembered, you know, as the girl like, oh, here I am again having another termination, you know. So that's why she was trying to be sort of under the radar, but she ended up having to go to that same clinic. This time, I believe, I'm not sure what happened the first time, but this time she gives the clinic wrong information and makes up a fictional story about her circumstances because she just didn't want to be traced back to her. And I'm sure some of you guys can imagine or know, 20 weeks, the baby is five months old. So it's not an embryo. Not that I'm justifying it, but I'm saying that it's a baby, you know? So the procedure is a lot more invasive, a lot more. And it's a very traumatic experience, especially when you're doing it all by yourself and there's no one to support you. So I can imagine how difficult that must have been for her. But at the same time, Kelly is choosing to do this this way and she's choosing to do it alone. She very well could have told Aaron, but if she was cheating on him, there's a reason why she couldn't tell him. Now in the documentary, Kelly touches on this termination and she states that after this one she actually wasn't offered any counseling which to her caused her a lot of grief and this possibly may be the reason or was the start of her extreme secrecy she stated that after this abortion she did not ever want to go through another abortion again but one thing that was strange about that statement that she made if you didn't give your right details how are you going to be offered counseling, right? Like maybe they did try to contact you, but if you didn't give them the right details, they can't. Now, one thing that kind of, when I, when, at least when I was first reading about this, these, this case, you hear about these pregnancies and the terminations, but remember, she's a water polo player. She was still playing during this whole time. During the first pregnancy, which maybe she was a little bit, um, less far along, but five months pregnant, she was fully playing this quite aggressive sport. That meant intense training, grueling schedules, and water polo isn't a gentle sport. It's very intense. It's like a little fight in the water. Another thing that I thought was kind of strange is that, again, if anyone plays sports or played sports, let me know but you have a whole bunch of teammates, right? So aren't you kind of a little bit close to them? So she didn't tell anyone, like there was no one she could trust. And she's playing sports with these girls while she's five months pregnant. Now there were questions as to why people in the pool, the other girls did not suspect that Kelly was pregnant, but 
there was this type of mentality with these girls and with these players that it was a work hard, play hard mentality. So they worked hard, they trained, they really gave their all to the sport, but then they also partied really hard. And Kelly allegedly kept up this pace. She partied, she didn't miss a beat, she didn't miss training, she didn't show any signs of of slowing down. So maybe that's why none of the girls ever, or majority of the girls, didn't suspect anything. Her next relationship was from the period of 1994 to 1998, and she was in a relationship with a man named Duncan Gillies. Kelly was around 19, and she was in this relationship from the age of 19 to 23, and Duncan said he quickly fell head over heels for Kelly, and within six weeks of being with her, he was already thinking about marrying her. The both of them had a mutual commitment to sport, and along with this commitment to sport, they were both really into partying. From what it seems like, it's like that generation or that group that she was around were just heavy partiers. They were really, that was just a thing. So during this time, Kelly's working as a PE teacher and playing water polo at this elite level. Now in 1995, okay, she falls pregnant for the third time this time after that traumatic abortion the second time she decides to keep the baby and what I mean by that is go ahead with the pregnancy we'll get we'll get into it so she carries on with this pregnancy and never tells a single soul that she's pregnant not even Duncan she continues with her normal life she continues playing the sport and No one suspects a thing. Not her family, not her teammates, not Duncan. Duncan states that during this time in their relationship, he, obviously they were, they were sleeping together. I mean, she got pregnant, but anytime they would sleep together, Kelly would only sleep with him in this one position, which was spooning, which is from the back, laying down. And every time he tried to cuddle her or put his hand over her stomach, she would like push it away. Her teammates would later on say that she always would cover herself self up with a towel and she never did that before. And she would do this thing where she would like cover her bottom half with a towel, walk to the edge of the pool and then like slip off her towel and then slip into the water. Like instead of just walking around in the bathing suit, keep in mind her mom is her manager, right? So her mom is seeing her in a bathing suit a lot of the time doesn't suspect a thing. A lot of people from what I was seeing online, they were like, how could anyone not know she was pregnant? I mean, she would have had to have a belly, blah, blah, blah. But I don't actually find it that crazy. I mean, by the ninth month of her pregnancy, maybe that's a bit mm, like, how do you not notice? Unless maybe she was a bigger girl, but she wasn't. She was very fit, you know, very, very fit. But the reason why I'm saying I don't think it's that wild is because when I was pregnant, both times, I had like a teeny, tiny belly. Like I just kind of looked fat. I was pretty insecure about it because people would be like, oh my God, how are you six months pregnant? Like you don't look pregnant. And I was like, but there's a baby in there. Like, trust me, (laughs) you know, it just felt like I was bloated. That's, that's what it looked like. And I'm not the tiniest person, but you know, just, I don't know, just, that's just the way it was. And it was like that up until like the seventh month is when I probably kind of started to look a bit more pregnant because of the way my belly would just like fill out. It, it was kind of like, okay, well, she's probably pregnant. I didn't even tell people I was pregnant until I was six, six and a half months pregnant, seven months pregnant because they just didn't know. Kelly, if she was tall, maybe she had a long torso. If you're athletic, you know, your ab muscles kind of can hold your belly in a little bit differently. And maybe that's why it wasn't so obvious, but also, with each subsequent subsequent pregnancy, you do show a little bit faster. So, yeah, she was just not showing. I can believe that people didn't know for the first few months, but by the end, I feel like it's pretty hard to hide. So, and and if you're doing these things to hide it, that's even more obvious, right? Now, it wasn't that no one thought she was pregnant. There was one teammate who states that 
they were swimming and they were playing or training in the water and she either had a suspicion or she accidentally swam underwater but she swims under the water and as she's swimming she like sees Kelly's torso and as she's waiting in the water like it's like a clear bump so this girl who had seen that goes and tells Kelly's coach like hey Kelly might be pregnant like maybe we should talk to her about it and the coach he goes up and he asks Kelly like you know this is what I've been hearing and Kelly just flat out denies it and you know you wouldn't expect someone to lie about that so I'm guessing when the coach hears Kelly say no you know I'm not pregnant what are you talking about he's kind of like okay because you just don't expect someone to lie about it but in the world of sports something like that can ruin your career it's possible that they would lie about it there's plenty of reason to do so but maybe the coach you know people around her are like no she wouldn't lie about that like who lies about that how can you lie about that maybe they just didn't they couldn't imagine someone would do that when Kelly's mother, Sandra, was interviewed, she insists that she never suspected Kelly to ever be pregnant and she had never heard of these rumors, which I find kind of because apparently that town was super small. Everyone knew them. If everyone knows your daughter and your family, I'm sure they're talking about her. I'm sure you'd, you would have heard something. You train so many girls too, or you were, I'm sure Kelly wasn't just your only client, you know? I don't know. Despite coaching your daughter, seeing her in a bathing suit probably every day and coaching or being around a bunch of girls that are most likely gossiping about your daughter, I don't know, seems a bit fishy. But then as a mom, like, why would you not want to help your daughter if you like suspected that I that's also sort of like where it gets confusing because most moms would want to help their daughter so now at 19 she plays at this suburban water polo match she goes to the post-match function and hours later she walks into King George uh, hospital in Camberdown in labor and gives birth to a baby girl she decides to adopt the baby out and her daughter is quietly and quickly adopted to a couple. And on the birth certificate, she puts down Duncan as the baby's father. He has no idea that this even happens. Now, after she gives birth and while the adoptive parents and the adoption is being arranged, Kelly does have contact with the child um, as she helps in like agreeing to who the adoptive parents are going to be. Now, the thing that blows my mind, apparently during that game, that suburban game, she was having contractions the entire time, but she goes ahead and plays the entire game. She goes to the post-match function and then quietly like, okay, it's time to give birth. Like she goes and just gives birth without anyone knowing. Like, wow. She must have either been super ashamed, very afraid, or both to just be able to do this. Like, the strength that it takes to do that? My goodness. To hide such a massive event in your life, it's... I know it can be shameful to some, especially being so young, but... It's just like, it, it blows my mind. Now it's stated that Kelly was actually brought to the hospital by a man who wheeled her into the hospital in a wheelchair. And the doctors initially thought he was her boyfriend, but she was like, no. And this man has never been found or maybe he just doesn't want to come forward. But um, what I think, or what, that's just what I think, maybe he saw her in pain from her contractions. Maybe she waited till like, you know, hours later. I mean, contractions can take that long especially if it's your first birth but maybe he saw her and then he helped her and wheeled her in you know and just never came forward maybe he didn't even know who she was like he just didn't remember so then obviously because you've just given birth you can't just leave and I'm sure she would have if she could but she spends the next two days recovering from her birth in hospital and at the same time she it was her birthday she was turning 20 so her first child, like first live child, was 
born like a couple of days before her birthday. And normally that would be something, you know, moms are happy about. And I don't know, it's just, it's a sensitive issue to me. So here she is, she turned 20, she had a baby two days before her 20th birthday and no one knows. None of her friends or family know where she is. I mean, she had probably attended that function that after that match, but then she disappeared and no one questions her. And I don't know where she lived. I believe she still lived with her family. So if I was 20 and I just like disappeared, like my parents would be like, there would be a search party for, for sure. But another thing that's crazy as if this case isn't crazy enough already during those two days that she is recovering, I don't know the exact day, but I think it's during maybe this day after she gave, gave birth because it was her birthday. She manages to sneak out of the hospital and go drinking with her friends to celebrate her birthday. How? How, Sway? I'm not judging her. I just find it wild. Like, how the hell did you manage, first of all, to play an intense sport while you're having contractions and then sneak, I mean, sneak away, give birth, have the baby adopted, celebrate your birthday, sneak out to go drink because you need to celebrate your birthday. Like she is tactful. I mean, isn't your area still healing? Aren't you exhausted from having a baby? Like, aren't you tired? I don't, I don't know. I don't know how she did it. Another thing is, where's the baby? Because I don't think the baby just gets magically adopted when, within a day. And I've given birth in Australian hospitals, right? So you have the baby and then they wheel the baby in like this little glass bassinet or plastic, whatever it's called, bassinet. And the baby stays with you the whole time. Like, you know, in the movies, when you see the baby goes off to like this nursery room, that's what I thought happens. I thought when you give birth, the baby goes to a nursery room and you like sleep. But <laughs> that's not what happened with me. But maybe back then it was different. Maybe the baby stayed in a nursery. Maybe she asked the nurses, can I just go do something and have a break and someone watch it? Because they don't discharge the baby until the baby passes all these tests. So unless things were very different back then, I'm like, what? where was the baby? How did you, how long did you go drinking for? And then were you breastfeeding? Because how did you drink? Like, it's just confusing. Also, again, if unless things were very, very different back then, I wasn't allowed to leave. I was trying to leave the hospital. I was like, get me out of here. But they don't let you leave. So how, how, to, I, I, I think the more I'm, the more I'm saying this, I think she snuck out. And I think I read somewhere that she did, but I just, I just don't get how she did it. So I think, yeah, she, ha she had to have. So now early 1996, Kelly is 20. She gets a job now being a teacher at a private school, continues her water polo career, and she goes on to represent Australia at the World Championships in Canada. And I think she receives like a silver medal. So she's very good. Okay, now if you're like me, you're thinking the same thing. She's 20. She's gone through like three pregnancies, all kind of traumatic. I mean, they, no, yes, they are all traumatic. Two terminations, one live birth, and adoption. Maybe now Kelly would honestly be afraid of having sex. Maybe she would be more cautious. Maybe she would be like, okay, maybe I'll just take a break from sex for a while because I do fall pregnant very easily. But sadly, no. One and a half years later, after giving birth to her first daughter, Kelly finds herself pregnant again. It's now her 21st birthday and she's pregnant. She's actually four months pregnant and she is surrounded with all her family and friends and she's drinking, she's partying, she's enjoying her life. And I've seen the photos of this 21st birthday party. And again, you can't tell that she's pregnant. Uh, I think she's wearing jeans. If I'm thinking of the right photo, I think she's wearing jeans and jeans would hurt if you have a big belly. So she's just one of those people that doesn't really show. And the strange thing to me is she is in this long-term relationship with Duncan. They seem to be in love if he's thinking about marriage and you can't confide in him. So what type of relationship is this really? I'm just genuinely curious as to 
what's going on, why they're clearly sleeping together. She's getting pregnant by him, but she can't tell him. This seems to be more of a Kelly issue. I mean, you're having sex with him consistently enough to fall pregnant every few months, but unless you're cheating on him, you know, unless you're with another man and it's this, it could be this other man's baby, why not just confide in him? Why not? Who knows, Kelly? The craziest thing about this case, as you guys can imagine, is the fact that she just falls pregnant and manages to hide and conceal these pregnancies from everyone. I'm guessing majority. I'm guessing there are some people that had suspicions, but majority of people, you know? From Kelly's point of view, she thought concealing these pregnancies like wasn't a big deal. She was like, it's not even that hard. In her eyes, it was almost too easy. She would just wear baggy clothes, cover up herself with a towel and just continue on with her normal life. And people say that she, yeah, like what, what I'm saying, she carried her pregnancy very differently, at least differently to what most people would visualize what a pregnant woman looks like. I believe they say that she carried more like, can't show you my stomach, but she carried more like widely around the stomach rather than the classic like egg shape where it protrudes out. So maybe it just kind of like spread spread around and that's why it was easier to hide. And because she was this elite athlete, she knew how to compart, I can't say this word, compartmentalize pain. So possibly like the aches and pains that come with being pregnant, she was just like disciplined in her mind that she knew how to just like focus and deal with it. She could put this pain in a box and she was trained to, you know, take that pain and train through it. You know, like, let's just keep going and work harder, if anything. Kelly even has said she doesn't even know how people didn't say anything to her. And remember, she's working at this prestigious private school now. And I, look, we keep saying, well, this story goes on to say like, oh, no one knew she was pregnant. But I think what that means is no one close to her ever like confronted her about it. And there were rumors going around about her being pregnant. So it, it, clearly there was like some idea. Some people were not that dumb. You know, they kind of had an idea. Okay, maybe she's pregnant. But Kelly kind of walked through life pretending that like, oh, nobody notices my changing body. Like, I'm just going to put a towel. No one's ever going to know. And that's just how she went through it. And I guess because no one's confronting you. You're just like, no one knows. Now, no one really gossip. Well, many people didn't actually gossip about Kelly in this private school, but as she walked through and her, as the months progressed and as her belly was growing, like parents would look and, you know, give her like sneering glances and like make comments maybe between each other. And it's just a shame that no one ever confronted her. And I think this more so had to do with the fact that you know, this teacher might be pregnant, but she's not married. Like back then, maybe that was just more of a stigma. One of her teammates does say that she regrets not confronting Kelly and not asking her like, hey, you know, how are you? Are you okay? Things like that. Because just to offer her support, because um, she states that there were times when people would question it. And especially the fact that she would walk uh, to the pool with a towel around her waist and then like take it off at the poolside and slip into the water. Like it just wasn't normal because I'm guessing when she wasn't pregnant in those few months that she wouldn't be pregnant, she wouldn't do that. And then she'd fall pregnant and then do it again. So the thing that I find mind blowing about it is that if you, you are her teammate, you probably know her a little bit better than a regular friend. Why isn't anyone asking her? Like if, if, and especially if you guys are having these suspicions every few months, are you like, this girl's getting pregnant every few months, but there's no baby. Like what's happening? You know, it's just strange, strange, strange situation. In April, 1996, Duncan, Kelly's boyfriend, he goes and he buys a house in a different suburb from where Kelly lives. And it's around this time that he actually cheats on Kelly with one of her teammates actually. And from what I understood about this, that Kelly kind of knew that this teammate was like, was like that. Like she was kind of like Mr. Steal Your Man, but she knew that it was possibly going to happen between her and Duncan. So anyway, so she wasn't really surprised, but also around that time, their relationship just started to unravel. And by 1998, they were done. And the crazy thing is Duncan, he actually breaks up with Kelly because he falls in love with another woman. And throughout this time, Duncan says that 
the whole time he was with Kelly, he never suspected anything, even though she didn't let him touch his belly and they only seemed to have sex in the one position. But yeah, he just never suspected anything. And that was that. On 12th September 1996, Kelly gives birth to her second daughter named Tegan. Tegan Lee Lane was born at Auburn Hospital. And a fun little fact, Jay was also born at this same hospital. And Kelly chose this hospital this time because it was a little further away from her friends and family. Like it was a little less chance of bumping into anyone. And I believe she initially tried to get induced at another hospital, maybe even a little bit further away, but um, they refused. So she gave birth to Tegan Lee Lane at Auburn Hospital. And this time when she gave birth to Tegan at Auburn Hospital, she gave her real name and her real date of birth, but she gave her wrong phone number and wrong address. And just quickly, in Australia, we have a thing called Medicare, right? Which has like all your details on it. You have to give that number and then that's how you give, that's how you get medical, what do you call it? Medical care, right? So I wonder if it was different back then. Um, because how did she give birth in hospital for free without having like some details? Do you just give your name and address? If someone knows about what it was like back then, can you comment below? Because I have no idea. Because Jay's mom told me, like she showed me her medical records because when I was re researching researching this case and I found out they were born at the same hospital I was like oh I wanted to see what the records were like and yeah it's it's quite extensive so I'm just like how did you just give like no information so hospital records show that after Kelly gives birth to Tegan she actually did have some connection with her she breastfed Tegan she bathed her she even slept with her all the normal things moms do with their newborns. Baby Tegan was born healthy and she even had conversations with doctors and she had all her little checks done and hospital uh, and the doctors were prepared to discharge her and baby Tegan from the hospital. And they were discharged, well due to be discharged very quickly, just two days after Kelly had given birth. And this could have been because Kelly requested it, but they were quickly discharged on 14th of September, 1996. And normally when you have a newborn, they obviously do certain tests and stuff like that. And majority of the tests are just um, like physical tests. Like they check the baby and they do like this APGAR score, I believe. But they also do a newborn heel prick test, which is they prick the baby's heel and they take blood and test the blood for certain conditions. And I believe you can refuse this test because... Pretty sure when I gave birth to Alea, they they asked me if it's okay, but I was like half delusional. I was like, yeah, yeah, do the test. But I remember when they were doing her heel prick, it's quite a lot of blood. Like I know it's from a like it's just from the heel, but Alea bled a lot. Like I remember her socks were like bloody. So they do this test and then they give you the results. I believe I believe they don't give you results. So if everything is good, you don't hear anything. So. I know that that's kind of like a mandatory test, but Kelly left the hospital without baby Tegan doing that. And I don't know if that was like, maybe she refused it, but I don't know if that's an error in the hospital's part, but basically she leaves the hospital and there's no DNA of Tegan taken. So notes show that she was discharged at 2 PM, but there's also like disputing, um, opinions regarding that because one of the nurses says that she was actually discharged at 11 a.m but the note was taken at 2 p.m and the reason why this is important is because the next time that kelly is seen because again most likely after she gave birth she disappears again for two days maybe she just tells her friends and family like i was at whoever's house right but the next time after giving birth to taken and being discharged on the 14th of september 1996 she is seen at her parents house on the 14th of september 1996 at 3 p.m. So if she was discharged at 11, 12 p.m., there's like three hours, four hours from when her parents see her next. But if she's discharged at 2 p.m., there's only an hour between from when she left the hospital and when she's seen by her parents. But either way, when she arrives at her parents' house, she arrives alone. There's no baby Tegan with her. Then again, in true Kelly fashion, 
she goes out that night, again, two days after giving birth, goes to a friend's wedding with her boyfriend, Duncan. I mean, phew, the baby came right before the wedding, right? So thank goodness that she can go to this wedding. But she goes to this wedding and acts like nothing happened. What baby? What birth? My vagina's fine. So now her family, or I think her mom, was at the wedding and so were a bunch of her friends. Not a single person at that wedding thought anything, thought anything seemed off. She gives birth, leaves hospital, goes home, changes into fancy clothes, meets Duncan, goes to this wedding. Like she just carries on with her life once again. Fourth baby, second birth. I mean, doesn't a girl need to recover? It's just like, she's crazy. I mean, I don't know how she did this, but dang, the mind can be so strong. But a newborn isn't. So where is baby Tegan? Who's feeding her? Who's with her? Who's cuddling her? Who's caring for her? Oh my God, that's going to make me so upset. So now fast forwarding three years. For three years, no one even knows about baby Tegan. No one knew she was even missing. I mean, no one even knew she existed. I mean, but who cares, right? Because we got to just move on with life. So anyway, oh, it is now May 1999. Kelly, you guessed it, she's pregnant again, but she's not with Duncan. So we don't know who this baby father is. But this time earlier in February 1999, she goes to another abortion clinic. However, um, in Queensland this time, but this clinic refuses to perform this abortion. And it is because she's even further along than last time. She's 25 weeks pregnant. In May 1999, Kelly gives birth to her third child, um, baby boy. And this time she also gives this baby up for adoption. Again, her family, no clue. She was even pregnant. No clue that this was her third live birth and her second adoption. Now, during the adoption process, she is asked a bunch of questions by the social worker and she lies and states, oh, it's my first pregnancy and, you know, um, I don't know who the father is and all these. She just lies. She just doesn't tell the truth. Once again, she gives this social worker the wrong address and wrong phone number, which would turn out to be a huge, huge mistake. But again, Kelly moves on with her life. She's just on to the next. However, because she gave the wrong information to this social worker and adoption agency, it made their job very difficult. And they tried to contact her and they were like, hold on, this information is wrong and we can't contact the birth mother and they probably needed certain information from her. So that caused them to start digging into her file. The adoption agency had been desperately trying to get in touch with Kelly to finalize the adoption and they couldn't. So, well, because Kelly had gone dark. So they were very concerned about the welfare of this child. They just have this child, but they don't they don't have the adoption finalized because I believe with the first adoption, she finalized it like in those two days, but this is a few years later and perhaps the system had changed, processes had changed. It was just different this time. So because Kelly was nowhere to be found, it caused the um, foster care agreement to lapse, which made that poor baby boy have to be handed over to the Department of Child Services. Now, this agency, Anglicare, they're doing their due diligence and trying to look into the background of the birth mother. And the more they dig, the more inconsistencies they find. Kelly had given so many different addresses and such like wild stories. Like some of her addresses were in the UK. So this caused them to become very suspicious of Kelly and the web that she was weaving was just too tangled. So nothing makes sense. So this social worker, he goes and he starts digging into her background and he contacts the hospitals. He finds out Kelly has given birth so many times. He collates this information, tracks down Kelly and finally confronts her about, hold on, you had this baby, baby Tegan, where's she at? 
because all the other records matched up sort of, you know, in a way, well, abortions and the adoption, but, and this baby boy was in the system, but where's this other baby? What happened to her? She had given birth to the second child at Auburn Hospital. She was discharged, but then the trail ends there. Where is Tegan? At this point, Tegan was missing for over three years. Kelly denies even giving birth to Tegan. What Tegan? What baby? And then as she is being investigated by this social worker, she goes on a holiday. And then when she is questioned again, she's like, oh, Tegan, that baby. Yeah, yeah, I gave it to a um, some couple in Perth in Western Australia. Tegan lives with this um, this family in Perth, but I haven't had contact with her in a long time. So just don't, just don't ask me any more about it. She said, you know, this couple befriended her and supported Tegan and her and she now um, hasn't had any contact and she doesn't really know any details. So like she's not sure herself. So we can just leave it at that. Now this social worker, obviously after she failed to give him the details and the information he was looking for, he's like, no, nah, something is sus. So he handed over this information to the police. So now this matters with the police and the police are policing. I mean, they have a full investigation going on, but Kelly's just like, anyway, and she's just living her life still. Once again, when she is 25 years old now, she falls pregnant in the year 2000. Now this is the first time she chooses to keep the baby for herself. And the first time she shares this news with her boyfriend and her friends and family. This time, Kelly sees a doctor regularly, which she didn't do with any of her previous pregnancies. She doesn't cover anything up. There are no deceptions. Now, I was curious as to why this time, you know, why did she not feel the need to like, what about her career and everything now? Because, you know, she's still quite young, 25. But is it just because this these little few years, you know, between 20 and 25 made a huge difference in how she would have been perceived. Did time progress to the point where now being unmarried and having a child is no longer shameful? Like, or was it because this police investigation and this social worker were sus about her? So now it's no longer something to hide. Could she not get away with it again? I mean, I don't know. Now, as this investigation into missing baby Tegan ramps up, Kelly is uh, questioned once again. And this time during the interrogation, she admits to all five pregnancies. She says that Tegan's father was an older man who she was having a secret relationship with. I believe... Uh, she admits to having this affair while she was still with Duncan. She then states that after giving birth, this man took Tegan into his care two days after her birth on the 14th of September, 1996, when she was two days old. She says this mysterious man, his name was Andrew Morris, but she's unable to give any further details, address, location, anything about this mysterious man. She says she met him at a pub and they just had a very brief relationship. They had a quick little affair, had only known each other for a few weeks before she fell pregnant with his child. She said when she found out she was pregnant, she tells Andrew he called her a slut and accused her of trying to trap him into a relationship and that after Tegan was born, she you know, after the, after she gives birth, after she's discharged from the hospital, she hands over baby Tegan to Andrew Morris and his partner, which is a woman named Mel. And this exchange took place like right outside the hospital after she was discharged. And also Andrew's mother was present. So it was Mel, Andrew and Andrew's mother. She then states it was this trio that drove her home from the hospital before she went to that wedding. Now, when Kelly is being interviewed uh, and giving all this information, she's actually seven months pregnant at the time and nobody knew, like no, like the police officers didn't even know. So clearly her body and her genetics just held a pregnancy very differently. Now, you would think the police would be super desperate to find this Andrew Morris and 
locate him to locate baby Tegan, but they were doing like a half ass job. Two months later, Kelly gives birth to a little girl and the investigation just goes quiet. That is until a new detective takes over the case, Richard Gort, and the investigation opens right up again. Months had passed at this point and the detective brings in Kelly one more time for questioning and she gives the same story. You know, she had this affair. She gave birth to baby Tegan. She gave it to this guy named Andrew. But this time, the name of the man, still Andrew, but his last name is no longer Morris. It's Norris. The detective was like, yeah. She then just like laughs, like super embarrassed, like, oh, Oh, huh, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm confused. Maybe it's Morris or Norris. She's confused. Then she says, no, no, no. His name is Andrew Norris. And I actually got it wrong the first time. I think I must've said Morris, but it's actually Norris. I was wrong last time. I'm right this time. So then she's asked outright, did you kill baby Tegan? And she gets super upset. She's like, no. And she, she's just like, she seems really upset by this. And she's just like, no, I, how could you even ask me that? I would never do such a thing. And then she asks the detectives to turn off the tapes that are recording her because clearly she knew she was being recorded and obviously they don't do that. And she goes on to say, well, what happened to baby Tegan is between me and Andrew Norris. Like, I don't want my parents to find out about this. No one knew and I don't want them to know what's going on because no one knows about any of this. From this interview, she seems to be pretty upset about what other people are going to think, not just about the impact it's going to have on her life, but more so like, what are people going to think about you, you asking them about these pregnancies and about this baby that nobody even has a clue about. She seems just as upset about that, like them finding out as, um, about being questioned about whether she killed her baby. Clearly everyone finding out was going to be a huge issue for her. Police then tap into her phone um, conversations and she has a conversation about how she's distressed and upset that of the possibility of her current child, her fourth child or her fifth child um, being taken away from her. She's so worried about her family being so embarrassed about what she has done and the community as well about all the judgment that she will face. Her parents are then also interviewed and they kind of like, I don't know if they're just putting on an act, but they just kind of seem like it's not that big of a deal, to be honest. And they believe that Kelly hid all these things because she was trying to protect her family, protect her image, protect their standing in the community. The police then take Kelly's story very seriously. They go and they research, not research, they go and they look up every Norris in the world, <laughs> like in the whole of Australia. And they look for this man born between certain years because of the age she claimed he was, except for four that they couldn't track down. And Kelly had obviously said like, this is where I slept with him. This is where I met him. Like she gave locations and apartment buildings, not real addresses, but just like, oh, th it was, it was this apartment right here. So they went and they looked into all of it and they looked into past rental histories, records. They really looked. They went through the records of Sydney University where Kelly claims that Andrew studied. They also went through every single like school record looking for a girl named Tegan that would be born on that date. She would have been nine years old at the time and they checked 86,000 birth registrations. They thought that maybe someone who had taken Tegan into, her, into their care would have registered her birth around that time. All of Kelly's details and private life was searched, her medical history, her telephone records, everything. And there was like this massive search for baby Tegan or a little girl named Tegan and nothing. They found nothing. Now to everyone, it became increasingly likely that Kelly was lying. Her story kind of kept changing. In one interview, she stated that Oh yeah, I'd seen Tegan, you know, in early 1997, but police just think that that seems very unlikely because her story is just all over the place. Her ex-boyfriend Duncan was also interviewed, forgot the word, and he was like, what? What pregnancies? What babies? He had no clue. He was so shocked to even find out that Kelly had been pregnant during their relationship. When they were together, he said, you know, like I said before, that when they would sleep together, she wouldn't really let him touch her and 
it was a strange thing, but he's saying he never like that was that was never something that crossed his mind. He also said that they lived separately and they would just meet up, you know, to sleep together or whatever. And she would just leave first thing in the morning or really early in the morning. So he never like got to really see her. It's just kind of like they had their encounters and she bailed. It wasn't really like didn't seem like a very consistent relationship. He said he felt like an idiot and then he obviously gave his DNA. But what blows my mind is that when he was tested, he was found to not be the father of, father of the first or the third child. But she was with him in a relationship during that whole time. Now, it's impossible to know if he was Tegan's father or not because there was never any DNA taken of Tegan. And that's another thing that doesn't make sense to me being as I've given birth in Australia. And don't, like, when you give birth, don't they take, like, something? Like, don't they... Isn't your blood, like the placenta and like the umbilical cord, like there has to be some blood or does that all just get disposed? Does someone know who works in the medical field? Can you just tell me? Because it's confusing. There has, how do you not take any, how does a baby get born in your hospital and there's nothing of it? Like no, no trace. So in early 2004, Kelly goes and marries the father of her fourth child, the, the daughter that she chose to keep and she's just determined to just live her life she just goes on living her life and I don't know if it's like a denial or a coping mechanism or if she just doesn't understand the severity of what the hell's going on but now the case is now deferred to the coroner the coroner looks at the case and he offers Kelly a plea deal if she admits to the murder of baby Tegan and if she gave up the location of her body now let's keep in mind this plea deal comes with no sentencing. She would be off the hook. I don't know why they would do that, but Kelly goes to the hearing and she offers no further information. She sticks to her story and she's like, well, I don't have any other information to share. Doesn't that prove to you that I'm innocent? I don't understand why she doesn't take that offer. I mean, what is going on? It sh seems like the status is very important to this woman. She could have just told the truth because it just doesn't make sense. The story doesn't add up. Again, this is all alleged, but the story doesn't add up. Where is this baby? A baby doesn't just vanish. And who is this Andrew Norris? Morris. Norris. Morris. And if Andrew really took Tegan, wouldn't she be registered somewhere in some school? Like maybe her name was changed from Tegan, but there would be something that matches up. Maybe he did change her name, but what he changed his name to? Like he, the both of them disappeared. People also pointed out that Kelly's father was a police officer. So did he have something to do with the investigation where he, you know, threw a wrench in it. He had some connections and things were not investigated correctly. Like some things were, but then some things weren't. Like it was a bit of a jumble. Now the thing about this case, when it was happening, I didn't really hear about it. And the reason for that was there was, there was no information about this case available to the media because there was a non-publication order placed. But when Kelly refused this plea deal, it was like, all right, dismissed publicize. In February 2006, the coroner concludes that baby Tegan is most likely dead and this case is now referred to the homicide squad and the police finally conclude that this Andrew Morris Norris is a fictional person. Now the police, they don't have any evidence, conclusive evidence about Tegan's death. They don't have a body. So they decide not to move ahead and charge Kelly with anything. But they pass this case on to the Department of Public Prosecutions and in what they deem to be an unusual step, because there's no body, there's no evidence. On 17th November 2009, they charge Kelly with the murder of Tegan Lee Lane. Kelly pleads not guilty and the case moves to trial. So the matter was heard in the Supreme Court and the prosecution alleged that Kelly fell pregnant five times over seven years and in the 1990s terminated the first two pregnancies, gave up the third and the fifth babies for adoption and murdered her baby Tegan Lee Lane. They believe that the murder took place on the 14th of September 1996, the day she was discharged from the hospital and that Kelly concealed all these pregnancies from her friends and family and she did this in order to protect her personal image and reputation. They produced evidence that as a motive for murder, Kelly was willing to abandon all her children at birth to increase her chances at competing at the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games. 
They also believed that these children would interfere with her educational plans, her social life, what her family thought of her, her status in her social and her friends and her family circle. They also believed that this murder of Tegan took place because on the 14th of September, remember, she attended that wedding and that this wedding was a potential motive that what am I going to do with this baby? I can't take this baby to this wedding and everyone's going to like know about what I did and that she needed to get rid of Tegan to permanently hide this problem and the evidence of having a whole pregnancy and giving birth from her friends and her family. Kelly's constant story changing and this Andrew Norris and then, oh, I gave this the baby to this Perth couple. All of this was an indication of her guilt. Kelly's defense, on the other hand, based everything on the fact of, well, if Tegan was killed, where where was she killed? Where was her body? They claim that even if Kelly had killed Tegan, they cannot prove that she did so deliberately or with the intention to kill Tegan. How crazy is that? In the absence of evidence, in the absence of a body, in the absence of, well, where did she do it? How did she do it? Where is the evidence? They believed that they, the jury should acquit Kelly and she should not be held guilty for murder. The trial lasted for four months and on 13 December 2010, the jury found Kelly guilty, but guilty of lying under oath in relation to the adoption of those two babies that she adopted out. The jury was not able to come to a unanimous verdict on the murder charge. So the jury was sent back, deliberated some more. And a few hours later, on that same day, they found Kelly guilty of the murder of Tegan Lee Lane. On 15th April 2011, a few months later, Kelly was sentenced to 18 years in prison with a non-parole period of 13 years. She will be eligible for parole very soon on the 12th of May, 2023. Very soon. A few days later, there was this claim that a taxi driver had seen Kelly dump a baby on the side of the road. He states he was a taxi driver that was taking Kelly home from the hospital. And he says he picked up Kelly from Auburn Hospital. And on the way home, they stopped on this road called River Road. She asked him to stop. And he did so at her request. She gets out of the car, takes the baby, puts it on the side of the road in the bushland and gets back in the taxi. And then they drive on over to Manly. The driver says he then returns to the site where he believes that she placed the baby and he finds a woman there. This woman apparently tells the driver that, oh, I'm going to attend to the needs of this baby. And the taxi driver's like, Okay, and then he drives off. Police were apparently investigating this claim made by this taxi driver, but then the information kind of just like ends there. So I'm like, what? Oh my God, guys, this whole case is such a roller coaster. Like this taxi driver, okay? Like if you, if this woman had a baby with her in your taxi and then she tells you to pull over and she's like, hold on a second. And she goes and puts the baby on the side of the road in the bushes and gets back in the taxi without the baby and then why would you drive off wouldn't you be like hello lady your baby is in the bush it just doesn't make sense i highly recommend you guys check out kelly's interviews and the interviews with um the people in her life there's a whole australian documentary on it i believe so i'll leave the links below if i can if i can the whole situation kelly finds herself in it just doesn't look good let's be real it just doesn't sound good doesn't look good doesn't make sense there were a number of factors which made her or forced her to conceal her pregnancy, you know, the shame, you know, having to be this amazing sports star and not to disappoint her friends and her family. There was no room, it seemed, for mistakes. And Kelly made a ton of them, but she was supposed to be a winner and that was what was expected of her. And I think that's the problem with putting a lot of pressure on people because sometimes they can't live up to that and then they end up making worse mistakes than they would have if they were just you know not been so burdened in a way and I'm not excusing her I'm just saying pressure can really pressurize you I mean personally I don't understand why she would she would have killed baby Tegan because she gave all the other babies up for adoption she could have literally just left the baby in the hospital I mean yeah they, if she needed to go to this wedding or just don't go to the wedding Kelly the hell it's a wedding like if she didn't have time to adopt baby Tegan out, I mean, 
there had to have been other ways. She didn't have to take this baby home with her, but then what if she wanted to take the baby home with her? I mean, look, as a mom, you can't just give up these babies left and right. Just be like, oh, who cares? Who cares? Who cares? You, you can't. Like you, majority of people, you love that child. You feel that baby kicking for nine months. You build some sort of connection. What if she felt a connection with Tegan and she wanted to be a mom and she wanted to raise this baby and then something happened? She freaked out, you know? I, it's such a short period of time, three hours. What if she just freaked out in that short period of time and she was like, oh my God, no, I can't do it anymore. We don't know. Where is the proof? Where is the body? How could she do it in such a short period of time? No one ever found the body of baby Tegan. She went to a wedding after killing a baby and acting completely normal. It just doesn't make sense, right? There are no signs to show that she had any mental issues, but... Again, the question, where is baby Tegan? Nothing about that day makes any sense to me. And it just doesn't, nothing adds up. But look, was she reckless in getting pregnant all the time? Yeah, guys, she was. Let's be real. She did not take birth control seriously. And I know you're not supposed to judge someone, okay? But guys, what about those poor babies? Who's looking out for them? There needs to be some accountability. You don't just have babies to just toss them aside and just throw them out for adoption every five minutes. Like it breaks my heart. And I know you guys sometimes, I don't know, whatever. Like if you think I'm being dramatic, but it's, it's not, it's like, you don't just have babies to just like get rid of them, whichever way you're getting rid of them. You know, like, I know it's better off that they are adopted out to a family that loves them, but you just can't just get reckless, be sorry, be reckless and have these babies left and right. If it was me after that first abortion, I would have been so traumatized that probably never would have had sex again, but I would have probably been so careful to not ever put myself in that position again, because if it's that traumatizing, why is it happening so much to you? Clearly you get pregnant very easily. There are people who are dying to have babies, you know, and you're getting pregnant so easily and just being reckless. Hiding pregnancies and playing such a fierce demanding sport is so stressful like hiding something alone is so stressful who wants to be doing that every few months kelly apparently let me know your thoughts on today's case down below guys what do you think it's wild thank you so much for watching guys and i will see you in the next one this it does bye